And there's been a really neat study where they had ladies who were iron deficient and they fed the, they gave them an iron infusion and they didn't give them any instructions on diet or exercise at all. And they just monitored them and they all lost weight. They all lost inches off their waist. They lost body fat. And if anything, their muscles improved. So what does this tell us? This tells us that iron is essential for energy expenditure. But here's the thing. You can have something that mimics iron deficiency, and that thing is inflammation. So what actually happens is we have actually evolved being exposed to pathogens. And if we have an infection, our body wants to react by saying, well, this bacteria actually needs iron to survive, so I'm going to lock my iron stores away mm. and prevent it from uh, being accessed by this pathogen, and that will help my immune system eradicate this pathogen. And this is a very sensible thing to do because it means that we get rid of infection quicker. Now, the problem is we've evolved with infections causing inflammation, but we haven't evolved with autoimmune disease. That's largely a modern disease. Right. And unfortunately, when we're inflamed from an autoimmune disease, the body responds as though it's an infection. And it responds by saying, okay, I've got this, uh, I'm inflamed, I'm going to lock my iron stores away. The problem is that the state of inflammation from an autoimmune problem is usually prolonged. And by locking the iron stores away, we're not just preventing pathogens from accessing it, we're also preventing our body from accessing it. So That's if you have a brilliant. chronic chronic inflamed state. It's what we call a functional iron deficiency. And here it gets a little bit tricky because the iron gets stored in a protein molecule called ferritin. And this ferritin molecule is actually what most doctors will measure in the blood test to see if you have enough iron stores. But this ferritin will also increase when you're inflamed. Basically, what will happen is whatever iron is coming into the body, the body will say, I'm just going to stuff it right inside this ferritin molecule. And your ferritin stores will increase and increase and increase. So you might have a very high store of iron, but that doesn't reflect your body's capacity to access that iron. So the availability of the iron bears no resemblance at all to what the store is. And mm -hmm. most doctors will look at a ferritin and say, oh, that's high, you've got plenty of iron, that can't be a problem. And yet you can still have problems with accessing it. And we call this anemia of chronic inflammation or something like that. We know that some people, if they're chronically inflamed, it will lead to a functional iron deficiency. Their body can't use the iron, you make less red blood cells, the red blood cells get smaller, you get tired, um, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're still inflamed because there's certain foods that you can still consume on a ketogenic diet that we know provoke inflammation, and uh, your listeners will probably be familiar with this term of a lectin. So things like nightshade vegetables, we're often consuming capsicum or bell peppers. We have chili peppers. We'll have eggplant or aubergine. So these kind of things are very rich in lectins. We'll often have a lot of nuts. People don't realize that cashew nuts, walnuts, they're actually seeds. They contain a lot of lectins. Peanuts, they're actually legumes. They contain a lot of potentially inflammatory lectins. So people on keto diets will still often be consuming a lot of these chemicals. So lectins are actually carbohydrate binding proteins that will trigger an inflammatory response. That will then mean that even though you have sky high stores of iron in the body, the body can't use the iron and effectively you're iron deficient. But here's the kicker. This is only thinking about it in terms of energy expenditure. It also has a massive, massive impact on our eating behaviors. And this is something that very few people understand because iron is essential for the synthesis of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters is the currency on which our brain operates. This is the serotonin. This is the noradrenaline. This is the dopamine. So if you have a chronically inflamed state where the iron's being locked away, that also means you are deficient in neurotransmitters. Your brain is not functioning. If you feel like you're in a brain fog and you're in a chronically inflamed state, so people classically with celiac disease, for instance, will describe this brain fog, that almost certainly is a neurotransmitter deficiency. And... The very interesting thing is if we take dopamine, one of these neurotransmitters we know that you need iron to synthesize, 
This is involved in the mesolimbic pathway, the reward pathway of the brain. So if you do something pleasurable, the reason you perceive it as being rewarding or fulfilling is because dopamine is being released. And if you were deficient in dopamine, that is effectively depression. So I believe the most important diagnostic feature in depression, if we have a look at the, uh, the diagnostic criteria, is one we call anhedonia. So anhedonia is loss of pleasure with everyday activities. You, you know, let's see, you get up in the morning and you see your dog, your dog comes running up to you, you pat him and you, ah, I feel good. If you lose the inherent pleasure in that, that would be consistent with anhedonia. And I think this is more valuable than feeling sad to diagnose depression because it might be just reactive. You know, you might have, uh, you might have lost your, you know, had something happen to somebody you loved or something like that. There might be a reason that you feel sad, but if you lose pleasure with these kind of things, anhedonia, I think that's a very good correlate for dopamine deficiency. So now think about it. You're chronically inflamed. Your body can't use the iron. You're not making dopamine. So you're just existing in a gray cloud. So what do you do? You self-medicate. How can you self-medicate? Well, if I have something sweet, then I might just try and get that little bit of extra stimulus out of my brain. I might just punch a little bit of the residual dopamine that I have left and lift that gray cloud, that gray veil for a few moments. That's self-medicating. And it's very predictable and very understandable. If you're effectively in a depressed state, then it's reasonable that you want to escape from it from time to time. And a lot of people I'm finding that with chronic inflammation or absolute iron deficiency, they're the people who are struggling with binge eating, who are struggling with sweet foods, who are struggling with carbohydrate addiction. And the solution isn't to do cognitive behavioral therapy and, you know, sort of challenge them and accuse people of being weak willed. The solution is to treat the cause of the inflammation or to restore the problem with the iron deficiency. When that happens, the body can then synthesize the appropriate amount of neurotransmitters, including dopamine, and then you actually lift the depression. And I've lost count of the number of patients I've had who uh, they haven't necessarily been chronically inflamed, but if they're low in iron, usually females through pregnancy, you lose blood in labor. You know, the fetus is a little parasite that takes blood away. And if you're menstruating, then you can often lose more blood. So females tend to be the ones who are absolutely iron deficient. When I give them an iron infusion, they come back and they often don't say, oh, I've got more energy. They say, I just feel better. Yeah. It's like a weight's been lifted from their shoulders. Their mood has significantly improved. And I think this effect of chronic inflammation involved in the iron pathways and the ability to synthesize neurotransmitters is really poorly understood in medicine. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And it makes so much sense because you have chronic inflammation, you have acute inflammation, which happens as a temporary response, and you have chronic inflammation that occurs in autoimmune dysregulation, autoimmune conditions that are just rampant right now from a lot of times coming from our diets and how that can trap some of that iron and make it less available to us for oxidation. And just to simplify things, um, for anyone who's coming across some of these concepts for the first time, but the concept that you initially came to with the iron connection to people having weight loss stalls and an inability to lose weight all went back to a lack of heme iron in the diet with one of your patients that you were working with. And I thought some of the stats you brought up were fascinating that 50% uh, men eat 50% more red meat than women, which is where all of that, you know, heme iron we get access to. And women tend to not um, also tend to eat a lot of salads and, and other foods and and well, women tend to be more health conscious and given yeah. our current public health messaging is that we actually vilify red meat who yeah. listens to that health message well females because yeah. they care about their health more and unfortunately that's uh, they're the population who loses iron through menstruation and through pregnancy and childbirth they're the population who need more red meat yes that's what i was going to say is the fact that men eat more red meat but then also the fact that you bring up the menstruation and showing in certain tables some of the stats on how much iron loss happens through menstruation, through childbirth, and all of that isn't even you know accounted for. Um, 
And those are sort of diff two different sides. You have less iron coming in, but then you also have this chronic inflammation that is actually robbing your body of some of that iron that you may be getting. Yeah, well, even if you have the iron coming in, you just store it in a stockpile that you cannot access. So if someone, I mean, one of the reasons I, off, one of the things that I often recommend to people is cut out nuts and cut out dairy if they're having weight loss stalls. But I wonder if the nut connection, you know, is n partly because it's a very calorically dense food, but part of it could be that it is, you know, blocking the absorption of some of the iron that's being taken in at the same time and also causing other, you know, potential uh, auto-inflammatory conditions? Well, certainly, if it's being co-consumed, then certain plant foods have anti-nutrients that prevent the absorption of real nutrients. So certainly, you know, we know that things like tannins in teas and things like that disturb the uh, absorption of iron. Nuts is a, a, an interesting thing for several reasons. First of all, things that people think are nuts are often not nuts. They're often seeds and they're often very rich in lectins. Um, and even then, the proper nuts may actually still have some lectins. And nuts are often salted. And we know that salt deficiency or sodium deficiency, more precisely, is actually a problem on ketogenic diets because you lower insulin, you lose more sodium from the body. So people will often be consuming nuts excessively, not because of the nut themselves, but because they're salted and they're actually just desiring that. They're what we call a Moorish kind of food. So if you're not looking, taking care of your sodium supplementation, then you may find yourself inadvertently over consuming nuts. And the simple thing is they are an energy dense food. So it's, uh, if you put too much of them in, it's going to have to have some effect on your weight loss. And then some people also get significant gastrointestinal distress from the nuts. I'm sure we're probably going to bring it up later, but they're very rich in fiber. And we know that fiber rather than helping the gut, is responsible for a significant amount of gastrointestinal distress. The very definition of fiber is that it's not digested by the body, it's <laughs> insoluble. In another word, this is like a malabsorption syndrome. And uh, when we have a look at the evidence, if you increase the fiber in the diet, you increase symptoms of bloating. If you increase fiber in the diet, you increase fecal bulk, you actually worsen symptoms of constipation. And in one experimental trial where they eliminated fiber from the diet, they had these in, it was a study of 63 people and uh, in one of the group they had 41 people who ended up going on a zero fiber diet. And at the start of the study, every one of those 41 had symptoms of constipation and they had a bunch of other symptoms including bleeding and pain and bloating and what have you. And in the zero fiber group, every single one of the participants had a complete elimination of every single symptom of constipation. Moreover, in a high fiber group, they were opening their bowels on average once every 6.83 days. In this other low fiber group, they were opening their bowels every day. Right. So th this whole notion that fiber is necessary for good gut health is not premised on any good quality evidence. And the best quality evidence we have is exactly the contrary.